All right, y'all turn to Mark 11. Mark 11, tonight we're going to talk about a fig tree that Jesus Christ cursed. People call it the barren fig tree, and that's fine. Barren means unfruitful. We're going to look at it tonight. We find it in Mark 11, and we're going to start reading in verse 12. When everybody gets it, Mark 11, 12. Now before we get going, let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, thank You for the privilege of coming together to worship You. We ask that You accept everything that we uh, say and do to Your honor and glory tonight and correct whatever we have wrong, Lord. We thank You for the wonderful privilege that it is to even be able to pray to You, to call You our Father. We know that the world can't do this, and it's only by Your choice that this is possible. And we know what it took to make it all happen, and that was the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank You so much for sending Your Son not only to deliver us from hell, but deliver us from sin and to bring us back into your house as we ought to have been in creation, only more glorious. We ask all these things in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. In Mark 11, 12, let's read it first. It says, On the morrow, now this is, uh, let's see, three days before Jesus is crucified, last week of his life. On the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off, having leaves, he came, if haply he might find any thereon. Notice haply. A haply doesn't mean happily. It means by chance. Now, there's a lot of arguing over this, and we're just going to look at it. But if haply he might find anything thereon. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. So they come on down the hill, verse 15, they come to Jerusalem, Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought the temple. He overthrew, overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. He would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. He taught them, saying unto them, it is, uh, is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer? You have made it a den of thieves. The scribes and the chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him. For they feared him, because all the people were astonished at his doctrine. When even was come, he went out of the city. In the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Peter, calling to remembrance, saith unto him, Master, behold the fig tree which thou cursest is withered away. All right, the first thing I want you all to notice about this incident is how it's tied. Two things happen in here, basically. He curses the fig tree, and then where do you find him at immediately next? In the temple. And what's he doing in the temple? Cleansing it. I mean, he's cleaning it out, isn't he? All right, I, I've just put some things up here that we want to talk about, just some heads about this fig tree. But before we do this, I want you all to consider this miracle. If you would compare the miracles that took place in the Old Testament, generally speaking, they were uh, incidents of God's wrath, weren't they? I mean, what were all ten of the plagues? That wasn't a blessing, was it? How about Elijah? Was Elijah generally going around blessing people in public or were they generally manifestations of God's displeasure? His displeasure. And publicly, Elijah called down fire, didn't he? And that sort of thing. But when you come over to the New Testament, you find just the opposite. Whereas Moses' law shows vengeance and wrath, that sort of thing, Jesus Christ comes and what do most of His miracles? Are they showing wrath or love? Love. love. The only one that you can find, really you could say two and you can't really count one. Remember when he cast out the devils and they went into the pigs mm -hmm. and the pigs went down the hill? Jesus didn't make them do that, okay? but that's just pigs. In this case though, he does curse this fig tree, doesn't he? So people ask lots of questions like they say, now how is this possible? How could Jesus even come to this fig tree and not know whether there was fruit on it? And it causes all kind of arguing. Mm -hmm. And we're just going to look at some of these points now. All right, this thing about the fig tree, rather than seeing it as a cursing under the fig tree, I think it's better if we see it as a blessing to the church. Now, why I say that is this. If, if, uh, if I had a pot of something cooked tonight and y'all come in, right? Wes comes in and, and looks at it and realizes there's poison in there, right? Would you say let, uh, Wes was cursing the pot if he told y'all don't eat it? It's poison in there? He's not cursing it. What's really going on? He's protecting you, isn't he? Mm -hmm. 
See, in this parable, what we're going to see is what the fig tree represents. Now, if we just let people say that it represents Israel as a nation and, and completely dispensationalize this thing, we're going to really miss the benefit for us. Because there's a lot of benefit in this thing for me and you, right? Now, let's just go consider some of these things. I wrote down just these seven things. I'm not saying this is exhaustive. I'm sure people could come up with plenty more. But some things about a fig tree. Number one, a fig tree has the biggest leaves of the trees in Israel. I mean, even in our fig tree, they got some massive leaves, don't they? Mm -hmm. And they're thick. They're plush, aren't they? Even though their eyes are itchy. You look at pictures of the fig trees over there, they get a lot bigger than our fig trees, but I mean, they are green. They're very, very big, okay? So the leaves are really big. Now, fig trees, even ours, which are a little different, but not much, a fig tree gets, looks like nothing but sticks in the winter, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. But you know, a fig tree is different. The leaves and the fruit come on together. Y'all ever notice that? It's the only tree we've got that does that that I know of. He, I've got one right around the corner back there, and we, we've only got a couple figs on it in the last couple years because it's so small. But as soon as it starts bearing leaves, you see these little bitty green bulbs growing on it. And the ones in the Middle East, they say, either the fruit buds first or with the leaves. But it's never like a normal tree where the leaves come first and then the fruit. So if Jesus saw a fig tree with leaves on it, what's the natural assumption? It's going to have fruit. Now, we're going to deal with the fact of whether He knew or not. Of course, it's God Almighty, and of course He knew. But that's another thing we want to think. The figs, always the, the fruit and the leaves coincide. The third thing, the fig tree had leaves. But notice what it says again. Look in verse uh, 13. Seen a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came. If haply he might find anything thereon, and when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. Would anybody in here be surprised if you went to a fig tree in late March or early April and found no figs on it? No. You'd be surprised if you did, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, I find out that my fig tree doesn't have leaves on it in late March. It, does, it starts, it's like, you know, most things bloom later. Well, the fig tree, the almond tree in the Middle East blooms first and the fig tree is one of the last. But when did Jesus die? What time of the year? The first Jewish month, the 14th day. Late March, early April, right? Would you, was it, is that the time of figs? Figs aren't har don't begin harvesting until June over there, and that's early, just a few. Fig, fig harvest is later in the year. So then, it was not the time of figs. Well, if it's not the time of figs, it's not the time of fig leaves either. They grow together. But this thing's got leaves out of season. Does that, does that make sense? That's why it says happily. In other words, if we were standing here and I said, is that a fig bush over there? And you said, yeah. And I said, man, it's April. Is that, has it got leaves? And you'd say, yeah. And I'd say, you reckon that thing's got fruit and walk over there? Now, I'm not saying that was Jesus' attitude, but that's the picture that's going on here. All right, next. The tree, this tree, this fig tree alone was cursed. Do you all think that that's the only tree that had no fruit? I mean, what about all the other trees on the Mount of Olives? Tons of olive trees, isn't there? How about, I mean, in, in late March and early April, there's a lot, hey, there's a lot of trees that don't even bear any edible fruit. Oak, elm, sycamore. But did Jesus pick out any of them? Did He pick out any of the fig trees that didn't have leaves? That time of year, they're not going to. He picked out one tree, didn't He? And why did He pick out that one tree? Because it had leaves. Now I want y'all to think what this is a picture of. The fig leaf in the scripture, in the fig tree, is a picture of man's religion. Where's the first time a fig leaf ever comes up in the Bible? Garden of Eden. Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve sinned, what was their first instinct? To cover themselves. Cover themselves by the works of their hands. And they covered themselves with fig leaves, the biggest leaves, mm -hmm. right? Did that do the job? And all the way through the rest of scripture the, fig leaf, scripture, the fig leaf is a representation of man's outward showy religion. Now y'all picture that fig leaf tree in your mind. It's making a big pompous show of its religion. Y'all have seen people like this, haven't you? Mm -hmm. And yet you come up, when you see someone making a big outward show about religion, well then you ought to expect fruit, shouldn't you? Mm -hmm. You ought to say, hey, this guy professes to be such a Christian, well then I ought to see the fruit. And mm -hmm. do you see any a lot of times? 
Yes. They're all leaves, right? That's what this tree represents. Think where Jesus was about to walk into. The temple. Now what would you call the temple? Being in a thieves. It's a den of thieves. But did they make a big show of being God's people? A big outward religious show? It was all outward pong, wasn't it? See, this is why the fig tree and this is tied so closely together. And of course, Israel at that time was the representation of the fig tree because they were the only nation that claimed to, to be God's people. Other nations worshipped pagan gods. But Israel at that time made the outward claim to be God's people, didn't it? So at that particular time, the fig tree represented them. But does that mean that the fig tree represented the political nation and it ended? Mm -mm. It, 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 we're going to look at this. We're going to show you this represents all public profession of Christ. And if it has no fruit, what is it? Barren. It's barren. It's no good. Okay, so now, the fifth thing. <laughs> the Lord desired fruit. Didn't it say He was hungry? The Lord desired fruit. The sixth day, the Lord expects fruit, doesn't He? Remember when He told the disciples, why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things I say? They were sent to bring forth fruit, weren't they? Mm -hmm. And then last, the tree is barren or unfruitful. Now if a tree is barren, that does not mean that it has played out. When a woman is barren, does that mean she's reached the age of not being able to have children? Barren means she's got something wrong with her. This tree doesn't bear fruit. Has it ever bared fruit? It never bore fruit. Then something's wrong with it, isn't it? All right. What human being in their flesh can bear fruit unto God? No. Who can work? Who can do one single work that God will approve of without regeneration? Nobody. But don't don't the, the world goes about trying to do it in yeah. the name of Christ? That's a fig tree. And Christ come up and said, "You'll never bear fruit, not from this moment forever." And when He cursed it, did He leave any life in that tree? No. It withered up from the fruits. He said, you will never bear fruit again, and that was it. Now, there are several trees in Scripture that the Lord uses as a picture, and they wither up, but guess what? Life remains in the, in the root. Y'all all cut down a tree and had it come back, hadn't you? Yeah. Well, many see, times. Huh? Many, many times. Many times. <laughs> He, uh, the, the point of this is you, you cut down a tree and if there's still life in the root, you can't see it and you think it's dead, but it comes back, doesn't it? But like, not this tree. Like perennials. Yeah, exactly. Now, in the case of this tree, if you just make this tree to be Israel, the people, the Jews, well, then it disagrees with other Scriptures because we're told that the Jew, they, they remain. How, well, how, how does the Jew remain? Has there ever been a time... In the last 2,000 years in the history of the church, that there wasn't at least one Jewish believer? There have always been, hadn't there? There's an influx of them coming based on Romans 11. But the point being is this they've never been cut off completely from God, have they? But this tree's cut off. What about a man that has the gospel preached unto him, like the Jews at the temple, the bulk of them, that hears the truth and makes a big outward show of being God's people, but really doesn't believe? Are they cut off? That person's cut off. Let's go back and consider these one by one. Alright, first off, the fig trees. The large leaves. Alright, it's making a big outward show. Now imagine somebody in connection to the temple. A man comes from out of town and he's coming to the temple in Jerusalem. Now he's a Jew. What is he expecting when he comes to the temple? Whose name is there? Who said they would dwell there? God, right? Right? So he's coming to the temple to draw nigh unto God, to see godliness, to learn godliness, to hear the word of God. He's coming there to draw nigh unto God, isn't he? He walks into the temple and immediately he's cast right in the middle of haggling over the price of a dove, of, of arguing over uh, reconcile rates to get his money converted into temple money and all that. What did they turn the temple into? Business. A, a, business, a den of thieves. Hey, they had money changers. Look, when I was little, we had an arcade. Remember Pac-Man, right? Mm -hmm. They had an arcade, and you, you at first you could put a quarter in this thing. Later on, though, you know what they started doing? Tokens. Tokens. Yep. Now, you could buy so many tokens, but guess what? For $5, you got $4.75 worth of tokens. Because they charge you for they changing them. They charge you for changing them. In other words, they figured out a way to make money even on the money, didn't they? Mm -hmm. Well, this is what the Jews were doing. They had turned it into a business. So here's some man comes from a foreign country. He hears that the God of Israel is at that temple. 
He comes a long distance to hear the wisdom of God's Word and to be around God's people and to learn about the true God. And instead, what does he get? Trying to sell him something. He's trying to sell him something. Does that sound familiar? That sounds real familiar. Mm -hmm. You go, you know, you could invite somebody. He, I, I once heard a, a man telling a story. He said a, his friend invited him to church. And he said when he finally got there, all they did was argue for an hour over the money they needed to put to make an addition on the church or something. Yeah. And that happens every week, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. What's any of that got to do? It's got nothing to do with God, no. does it? Uh -huh. So then when you went to the temple, even though it was this big, <coughs> pompous, outward show in the name of God, professing to be His children, was there life there? No. That's the fig tree. And it's not gone just because Israel and the temple went away. It's still on every corner in our country. It's throughout the world. Fig tree. Alright, now, um, let's see. How about with an individual also? Let's talk about the fig tree not only as a nation, the fig tree as the visible church that's, that's rotten, but how about the fig tree as an individual, one single individual? And you know, you've got someone that professes to be a Christian, and you sincerely want to, you know, you're, you're sincere about wanting to know about the Lord, and you want to, hey, what is this all about? And you come near unto them, and you want to hear about the God. You know, you're from some other country, maybe you're a Muslim or something else, and you want to know about this Jesus Christ. And they say, that's a Christian. And he's putting on this big fine show. So you sit down with him to talk and he's telling, uh, talking about making money and telling dirty jokes and just non-stop worldliness. What would you say? I don't want to be a member of that. Say, well, and I'm already like that. I'm already a member of this. How's this different, right? Mm -hmm. See, that person drew near unto the true temple of God, which is the believer today. Are there people today that are making a show like they're the temple? Yeah. And yet, what do you find? There are no, no fruit. fruit. No fruit. Okay? Alright, now, the fruit precedes the leaves. That's the next point. Y'all turn to 1 Timothy 3. 1 to do something, you know, we'd say a deacon or to a position in the church, not a position of authority and look at me, I've, I've been promoted. That ain't never what it was. It was a position of we've got some things that need doing. In other words, the first time deacons were named in a church, the church had grown and they had a lot of widows and of course they were responsible for feeding them and taking care and they started squabbling and arguing and Peter and the apostles said, hold on. You, 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 and you go handle this so we can continue studying the Word of God and prayer. In other words, we've got a job to do. Y'all handle this daily business. And that's all it ever was. It wasn't some position to be lifted up. Now, he's talking about how to pick men to do this. He says in verse 4, One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. By the way, if you have your children in subjection with all gravity, you know what that means? Put them down and keep them down. Y'all know that today they say, oh, that's child abuse. Does a child have to be put in their place? Yeah, yeah they do. And you've got to keep them in their place, don't you? He says, for if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Now, what do churches do today with someone that professes to be a believer? immediately they baptize them, add them to the rolls, and give them a job, don't they? Mm -hmm. And what did Paul, in three places we're told, don't do that. Do you all know what the old timers did with, with someone wanting to join their church? You know, they had churches and they had rolls and they kept it, it was big, so they had to have some kind of order, but they would examine them. In other words, they were looking for fruit. They were very careful not to, not to bring, you know, tares in among the wheat if they could help it. Now it still happened. But they examined them. In other words, they looked for fruit. They didn't go by leaves. Leaves is, oh, hallelujah, I'm born again. And the old timer would say, that's good. Let me watch you a while and see. And, you know, that's basically what it meant. So then the fruit precedes the leaves or it comes along with it. We might say it this way. What regenerates a Christian? 
Who? What power? The Lord through the power of the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit has regenerated that person and there's life, well then what else is there going to be? Fruit. Fruit. Now the life at first is, is just getting going, isn't it? Yep. And what's the fruit? The same. It's not, folks, this idea that people have that being born again means you just flipped over a new leaf and you're walking in mature perfection. There's, there's no truth to that. But if a person has got the Spirit, are they ever going to have just the life of the Spirit and never have the fruit of the Spirit? You know, there's trees all the time that die. Hey, that one in my front yard is a good example. Mm -hmm. We come real close to cutting that one down yeah, a couple years ago. We in there, but you we saw it. Yeah. Well, he lightning struck it. I don't know if y'all remember. It had a little strike down the tree, but it struck way out into the yard too. Burned it, blew up, blew up part up. Lightning got it. So I started looking at it. And I guess I had never paid attention. Well, I looked at it, and the leaves started falling off. And I thought, uh oh, you know. So I immediately I start thinking, I wonder what kind of wood it is and what I could do with it. But I, I'm looking at it and I think, so I talked to Dan, uh, who cuts trees down up there. He said, well, yeah, it probably is dead. He said, you can cut it down if you want, but I'd wait. Well, we waited and it waited and nothing ever happened. It was about three months. It took a long time. Yeah, it was dead as a doornail. Finally, I said, well, I guess we're going to have to cut that down. And guess what? A couple of little green, green sprigs come out on it. Now, from a distance, that thing looked dead as a doornail. But you know what? What did that first little green sprout prove? There's, life. There's life in there. Mm -hmm. Doesn't every tree basically do that? Yeah. Except for evergreens, they do, don't they? Yeah. All right. That tree, come to find out, is a black gum. They call it a tupelo. Y'all look at it right now. It's almost got all the leaves gone. It loses its leaves twice a year. And I can't remember if it's the first time or the second time it'll be bare for about four months, won't it, Lexi? See, I would have cut it down because I couldn't see any visible mm -hmm. life in it, right? But the life's not out in the leaf. Where's the life at? Roots. It's, it's in the, the sap. It's in the roots. It's in the, it, that's how the Spirit is. The, the life is inside. That's why Jesus told the apostles, don't you go trying to pull up the tares from the wheat. You'll, you'll get both. Now, are there times in a believer's life when he goes... He, he falls away and looks like it's... Yeah. It, hey, this is cyclical. Mm -hmm. Isn't there time in church history when it looked like the church is dead? And yet, is it? No. If that person's really a believer, even though that person may turn from the Lord and fall away, if he's truly a believer and he's regenerated, is there life in him? Yeah. And then the leaves are coming back and so will the fruit. Mm -hmm. But this fig tree had life when it wasn't supposed to have life. At least it looked like. See, it's a picture of Israel as they were claiming to be God's people and they were claiming to be putting forth all the fruits of the Spirit and yet did they have the Spirit? Mm -hmm. The Spirit hadn't come yet. The time of fruit went to the day of Pentecost. They were claiming it early, weren't they? Mm -hmm. Well, how about today? Do people ever claim to be the Christians and doing all these good works that have oh, never yeah. been regenerated? Mm -hmm. See, they're doing the same thing. They're trying to bring forth fruit out of season. Paul said... For by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest no. any man should boast. Can you work to save yourself? No. Can you earn spiritual life? No. no. But the next verse says, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So you can't work to save yourself, but are you saved to work? Yes. yes that's the picture. All right, now, uh, next thing. The tree had these leaves out of season. All right, again, harvest time was Pentecost. You know, there's a good example of this. Go over to uh, Acts 1. All right, when, it talks, when we talk about fruit, what is the fruit that Jesus Christ means when He said, making a spiritual application, you shall know them by their fruits? Did He mean physical things or spiritual? spiritual. And who is the source of this? Who really produces this fruit? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. It's called the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians, right? How could someone produce the fruit of the Spirit without the Spirit? Okay. You can't. Well, what we basically got here in this picture is we've got people trying to act like they were bearing fruit in the Lord when they didn't know the Lord yet. Okay. Now, in Acts 1, uh, Jesus just tells them, verse uh, 4 it says, 
being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which He saith, You have heard of Me. Now what was that promise? Next verse. Holy the Holy Spirit. John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And what does He tell them to do? Get busy that day? Wait in the room. Did they have the power to go out and do what they needed to do? Mm -mm. But on that day, did they get the power? Yep. By the way, what day was that? Pentecost. Pentecost. When does Pentecost fall in, in Israel's year? Early June. Guess when they start getting figs? Early June. See, I'm just showing y'all how Israel was claiming to be God's covenant people and have all this righteousness. Did they claim to have the righteousness which was of the law? And yet, did they? Had Jesus Christ come and fulfilled that law yet? Were they jumping the gun? Were they putting on a show of righteousness before the time? They certainly were. All right, now, um, all right, number four. Uh, this tree alone was cursed. All right, <clears throat> who? Let's do it this way. Did Jesus Christ ever curse Rome? Was Rome? What happened to Jerusalem in seventy A.D.? Folks, it was destroyed. I'm talking about down to the ground. They even put, the Romans put salt in the soil so they couldn't even grow anything. I mean, it was wiped out, right? Did that ever happen to Rome? Did it happen to Alexander the Great's kingdom? One kingdom conquered another, but it was never annihilated, was it? Did it ever happen to the Medo Persians? Did it ever happen to Babylon? Why did he only pick this one tree? Why didn't God, why did Jesus Christ not destroy Rome the way He destroyed Jerusalem? What's he the difference? He wasn't dealing with it. He wasn't dealing with it, that's right. What did it Jerusalem have and what did they claim? Folks, they were under covenant, weren't they? Y'all think about the covenant. There's only two things you're going to get under that covenant with He made with Israel. Blessings or cursings. Remember when He gave them the list in Deuteronomy? He said, pick this day. What's it going to be? If you walk the way I tell you to walk, He laid all these blessings, didn't He? He said, but if you turn from Me and walk contrary unto Me, all the cursings. Matter of fact, Moses got a representative from each of the tribes, and he stood there and he put six of them on one hill and six of them on another hill. And he said, blessings over here and cursings over there. See, God never entered into covenant relationship with any nation of Rome, Greece, any of them. He never did, did He? So that Israel suffered the price of claiming the position, didn't it? So then why did Jesus Christ only curse that fig tree? Well, it, it, he, yeah, it's a representative. But what about that tree? What was it about that tree that made it different from all the... Wasn't blooming right. That tree wasn't doing what it was supposed to. Mm -hmm. That tree was a Camelot. hypocrite. That's right. Look, that tree was an actor, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Was it acting like a fruitful fig tree out of season? Yeah. Don't y'all know there were other fig trees on that hill? Mm -hmm. They wouldn't have any leaves, or if they had any, they'd be tiny along with the fruit just starting to bloom, wouldn't they? So then that fig tree was put on a show, wasn't it? All right. What did Jesus Christ say about to who much is committed? Much is, much is expected. Yeah, yeah. Did these people have the Word of God given them? Did they have the position of being God's people on the earth? And what did they do with it? Nothing. Nothing. They turned it into a show of self-righteousness, mm -hmm. didn't they? Folks, y'all look at the Christian church today. They've got a name that they're alive, but Jesus Christ said many of them are dead, aren't they? Look about believers. People that profess to be believers. Now who's going to pay? Jesus Christ told the cities that He uh, performed miracles in up around Galilee. When they denied Him as He was leaving, He said, it's going to be better for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for you. Now why? Sodom and Gomorrah never saw the things they saw. Sodom and Gomorrah never heard the Jesus Christ preach. They seen all that. They, them people saw the Holy Spirit's the power. All they that. saw every bit of it. They still didn't believe. And still wouldn't believe. And that's what, exactly what he's talking about. Y'all flip over to Hebrews six, a very troublesome passage. But if you keep it in context, it, you can understand it. In Hebrews six. Hebrews 6, verse 4, he says, It is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift 
I want you all to notice it never says they were regenerated. They were enlightened. Folks, enlightened means somebody turns a light on and sheds some light on something, don't they? It says they tasted. You know, if you taste food, does that do you any good? You get anything from it? No. You've got to digest it, don't you? Mm -hmm. They tasted of the good Word of God, and the, or, sorry, have tasted of the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. That don't mean they were regenerated folks. They partook of the power of the Holy Ghost. Look, there was one group of people out there, literally, that ate bread, Jesus Christ turned five loaves and fed 5,000 men plus women and children. Mm -hmm. At least 15,000 people. Would you say that partook of the power of the Holy Ghost? Mm -hmm. Man, they saw it. You couldn't deny it, could you? But as soon as Jesus... They said they wanted to make Him a king that day. Y'all remember? Mm -hmm. They said, this man, we're going to make Him the king. Nothing's changed. You know, Rome knew exactly what the United States knew. It says, give them free bread and sports and you can do whatever you want to do. Does that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Those people got free bread and they said, hallelujah, this man for king, right? Mm -hmm. Jesus began to speak and when they heard His words, what did they say? Oh, this is hard. You remember what He told them that day? He said, you've got to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. And boy, people have gone. It had nothing to do with the Lord's Supper. It had nothing to do with cannibalism. What He was telling them is, you've tasted. You've got to eat. You've got to digest. Belief is not something that you just hear with ears and say, yeah, I believe that. If you really believe it, guess what? It goes in you and becomes a part of you. Mm -hmm. If you really believe something with all your heart, biblical faith, then is your body going to follow your mind? If it's true spiritual regeneration, there's going to be spiritual fruit. And that's all he's showing with this fig tree. Alright, now, in verse 5 he says, They tasted the good word of God, the powers of the world to come. If they shall fall away, it is impossible, he says, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Now here's the example, verse 7. For the earth, which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs, meat for them, by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. When God sends the rain on, on a farm and it brings forth what it's supposed to, that's a blessing from God, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But you know what that same rain also does? Next verse. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. Folks, that, that rain brings forth both, doesn't it? All right. Does God let it rain? Or does He make it to rain on the just and the unjust? Yes. Folks, God pours out certain amounts of His grace on, on all creation. They're allowed to live. They're all, look at Rome. Look at I mean, look at God never came and destroyed Rome like that. Rome never had that position. They never claimed to be what Israel was. Uh -huh. After all, talking about it rains on the just and unjust, and this world prophets right now, you know, and you can see it, but. People don't have nothing to do with God as long as they got that materialistic world coming oh, yeah. out. It's the worst thing in the world is prosperity. It is. Mm -hmm. it really, people don't believe that, but it's the worst. Yeah. In times of prosperity, what do people do? They forget all about they, the they, Lord. They forget the Lord, and, they, and then what happens in times of leanness? Yeah. Then they don't do it. Y'all never compare. There's, there's. You can do this all throughout the Bible, but y'all just take David and Solomon, right? David, what kind of a man? What was the most important thing in the world to David? The Lord. Folks, that man wanted to know God. He was running for his life most of the time. Even after he got made king, he had to run from his son and run. He wasn't a coward. He, God sent him on the run. He's in a cave running for his life and he can't stop. He's running and he's... Wait a minute, where's that piece of paper? Boy, I've got to write that down. What's he writing in them caves? Psalms. Folks, this man is praising the Lord, running for his life. I mean, y'all read about his life, I'm sure. Read First and Second Samuel. That man had a rough life, didn't he? You know anybody in the Bible that loved the Lord more? God said, it's a man after my own heart. But what about Solomon? Who's the most prosperous man that ever lived? Solomon. Who had everything given to him? Solomon. Who had wisdom handed to him wiser than any man that ever lived? And what did Solomon become? An idolater. Folks, that's what prosperity does. You, you've got to beware of it. Don't trust it. it. It's here today and gone tomorrow. 
The point being is God said put first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and He'll take care of the needs. That don't mean like i got a family member rob you blind and then turn around and say, seek first kingdom of God and He's going to give you the other stuff. Mm -hmm. That ain't what it's talking about. <laughs> That's like that Murdoch guy on TV. He heard him telling these people one day, you sent your money to the wrong man. They said they sent it to some piece. He said, nope, you should have sent it to me. Deion Sanders gave me a brand new Corvette. Look at the season he's having. <laughs> I mean, that's what people act mm -hmm. like. Right? That's, that's, that's silly. That's foolish. All right, now, in this context here, what does he mean that you've got a piece of land and God pours rain out on it, doesn't he? And the land brings forth the herbs. Well, what did that same shower also bring forth? Tears. Tears and thistles. See, the preaching of the gospel and the power of God is so powerful. It is so moving that even in an unregenerate person can it create a response. Don't y'all know Billy Graham could preach and give an invitation and people come down like cockroaches, mm -hmm. wouldn't they? Were they all regenerate? Mm -hmm. No. So basically what he's saying here is, was this going to be the effect of, of the work of the Holy Spirit? Folks, the work of the Spirit is powerful. Okay, so this is kind of, kind of again, what he's referencing here with this fig tree. Now, um, the fig tree shows the danger of profession. What I mean by that is, this, this tree alone was cursed because this tree alone was making a show, wasn't it? Hey, you know, when I, I made so many mistakes and still do make them, but when I first started preaching, I really <coughs> had such a sense of uh, uh, pride and arrogance about me about what I was being allowed to do. And, and I look back now on just the foolishness and the stupidity of so many of the things I did. But today, the, the longer I go in it, the more I'm scared of it. I don't know how to describe this to y'all, but you put yourself in a position of saying you're going to teach God's Word, then what else did you put yourself in a position to? Higher scrutiny. Yeah. Folks, there's two people in the Bible that are set to a, a higher judgment. Those priests in the Old Testament and the man that preaches in the New. It don't mean you're special. See, that's what Israel did. Israel pushed themselves to the forefront. He, I remember going to, they used to have a big old conference at, up, up north. And I, I went to this conference, and I'll never forget, there's probably four or 500 people there. And they had a buffet-style line, and when they got done, they said, okay, it's time to eat now. Preachers go first. And boy, we all got up, you know, went up there, and I, everybody was, you know, and it just felt always oh, so special. And I'm, That's the kind of foolishness this is. I mean, seriously, that's the kind of, you know what a preacher is? A servant. Yes. A servant, that's what he is. It ain't no, no position. But what did Israel do with the position of being God's light unto the nations? Did they humble themselves and glorify God? No. Instead, they did just the opposite. They're that tree out there with the big leaves. Look at me, look at me. Right? Alright, now. Um, let's see. I tell you, y'all go over to 1 Peter 4. It's a good verse that goes along with this idea here. In 1 Peter 4, verse uh, 17, Peter says, Time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Now, does judgment begin at the house of God? Yeah, well... When Jesus Christ comes back, what are we told is the very first thing that He addresses? Church. It's the church. He addresses the visible professing church. The wheat from the tares, mm -hmm. the goat from the sheep, right? He's got to cleanse His house, doesn't He? Well, how did His house get unclean? you got people come in and into the church that aren't regenerate. You got mm. tares among the wheat. Can you tell the difference about from a tear and a wheat looking at it? Mm -hmm. Folks, we had a man one time. Wayne, was you there? I don't remember if you come. This was the first time I went to the church in Pasco, and that man brought that wheat and tear. He he had them. He brought them from like Illinois or somewhere. And man, you look at them, and I'm telling you, I could not tell the difference. They looked that much alike. And I said, well, which one is it? And he knew. You know, he was an expert, but he knew. But do you know when you can tell the difference between a wheat and a tear? 
when they put on the fruit. Okay? He, we passed, uh, uh, we went to see Ralph yesterday. Chris went with us to see Ralph. And there's a field over there. They planted it last year too. And I don't know what it is, but it's got, it's the prettiest golden headed kernel looking. Oh, what do you think it is, Chris? Millet, maybe. Millet or barley or wheat or something. It's beautiful, golden heads on it, right? And it's level as can be out there, just as far. You, but you know what they say a tear puts on? A little bitty black bead. So when do you make the make, make the pronouncement tear or wheat? The fruit. Now this tree had no fruit, didn't it? But Jesus Christ said, no, you got leaves. If you got leaves, then there ought to be fruit. If you were really a fruitful tree, a fruitful fig tree cannot have leaves and not have fruit. It's impossible. So basically what he did was, that fig tree was condemned by his own words, wasn't he? What did Jesus Christ tell the people, the Jews, they would be condemned with? Their own words. Did they claim to be God's chosen people? We be Abraham's seed, right? There's your fig tree. Now again, don't let it end with Israel. Remember, this tree was cursed for good. Is according to Romans 11, is the is there a natural branches coming back into the olive tree? There's still life in that thing, right? This is in the false professor. This is not the Jewish people racially speaking. It's no, that group of people religiously speaking. Has that religion ever returned again? There ain't no temple. Now they're over there fighting and arguing like they're going to build one. And folks, they might. I have no idea. But has God got anything to do with that? Yeah. He said it will never bear fruit again from this day forward. Right? Alright. The next thing. The Lord expected fruit on this tree, didn't He? You know, a lot of fighting and arguing enters in over this point. Men say that Jesus Christ was not omniscient. He did not know everything. Otherwise, He wouldn't have thought this tree would have fruit. And they fight and argue. I heard a preacher that I like, a, a guy from Philadelphia. He's been dead a long time now, but he did a whole sermon one time to prove that Jesus Christ was not wrong in going to this tree, that it was possible that it would have dried figs from the year before. And he went through this whole long thing. Folks, that's still even Jesus Christ not knowing, isn't it? Did Jesus Christ go to this tree it really expecting a meal or did He go there to curse it? Curse. He went there to curse it. He was on the way to the temple to do what? Cleanse it and curse it. Alright, so as He comes to this fig tree, it's not that He's thinking, hey, maybe I'll find something to eat here. He did this for a reason. This does not lessen His deity. It magnifies it. Alright, now you're looking at John uh, 15. You know, we've got the same basic message so many times in the Scripture under different figures. Who plants a fig tree for the leaves? Nobody. Plant a fig tree for figs, don't you? Who lights a candle to hide it under the bushes? Who lights a candle to put it under the bed? Well, what does the Bible say is the Spirit is... Or what? Never mind. The Bible says the Spirit is the candle of a man. Does Jesus Christ regenerate a man to hide him or to let the light shine? Does the Holy Spirit come into someone in order for that person to continue right on living as they were? Or, is there, or are they going to now begin to bear fruit? It's not immediate. It's like anything. It takes time, doesn't it? But watch what he says here. Verse 1. John 15, 1. I am the true vine. Well, that tells you there's a false vine. And according to Revelation, there is. He said, I am the true vine, and my father is the husband. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now are you clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except you abide in me. Now, people say that this is someone can be saved one day and lost the next, cast out. We're talking about bearing fruit. Can, a, can that branch put forth any fruit if it ain't getting sap from the trunk? No. If it's not getting its nutrients, you know when it rains, tree in the front yard. Is that tree watered by the rain on the leaves? Mm -hmm. Where did they get its rain from? Right. From the roots. Does Christ and the Holy Spirit actually work in us to produce fruit? And if we don't, if we don't remain in Christ in the supply, if you cut the supply chain, what happens? Dry up. You dry up. He's talking about saved people that are saved. We're saved to bring forth fruit. Now, verse five, he says, 
I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Now, which one of us can do something without the Holy Spirit? No. Did the Jews have the Holy Spirit that he was talking about? No. You can't say as a nation they didn't because the apostles were Jewish. There was a small remnant that had it, wasn't there? Mm -hmm. Okay, what he was talking about was them and their religion and the entire system, that city, Jerusalem, which is below, not Jerusalem, which is above. That entire system of the Jews' religion, was it bringing forth fruit unto God? Mm -hmm. But was it putting on a fine show? Mm -hmm. Okay, verse 6. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch. Notice he didn't say cast out and go to hell. As a branch. A branch is meant to bear fruit. Folks, if you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ and you want to fight against Him and not bear fruit, is He going to continue to fight with you to bear fruit or will you just be set to the side? You know, when you've got a tree and it, we, we don't, I don't deal in branches ever, but I know about tomato bushes. You've got a tomato bush and there's a branch like this and that one comes up in the middle. We call that a sucker, don't we? Mm -hmm. What do you do with a Pinch sucker? It off. Why? It's sucking, it's not it's sucking up nutrients, nutrients that they will give you no fruit. Remember what we read about the rain? It rains and yet good crops come up, but something else comes up too. What do you do with the thorns and the thistles? They're naturally going to come up, aren't they? But are they bearing fruit? No. So what do they do with them? They kill them. They burn them. See, that's the picture here. And just to give you an idea of exactly what he means, come down again to verse 16. He says, Ye have not chosen me, I have chosen you, and ordained or appointed you, that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. Now, is there any way that these men were not supposed to bring forth fruit? They're going to bring forth fruit, aren't they? All right. If they don't bring forth fruit, are they going to remain in the position of the recipients of God's grace and blessings to produce fruit? Hey, you know, there's been so many times over the years I have experienced it. You, you, you set your focus on serving the Lord and studying and doing His will and everything else works out. It always does. You get your mind off on something in the world and try and step back in the world and everything else starts one by one to fall apart. It always happens. Sounds like old faith. Yeah, it is. It always is that way. Why? Because you've cut yourself off from, from the grace of God. That don't mean you're not saved. It means, look, we need a steady flow of this grace. Alright, uh, the Lord expected fruit. Paul said in Romans that we were saved to bring forth fruit unto God. Now go to uh, 2 Timothy 2. You see this prosperous world that we live in, supposedly, in Revelation in its last form, and we, we got it. I mean, you read about it in chapter 18. What was the thing God hated and was about to bring to a complete halt? That whole system. The buying and selling of everything under the sun, the merchandise, the ships to and fro, the captains and the industry and all that. And yet, was it the end of the world when it collapsed? Mm -hmm. People are there saying that, that when it you know collapses, it's going to be the end of the world. You better read the book of Revelation. Yeah. In Revelation 18, there was plenty of time for them to wail and mourn. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I used to ask my granny, I have always, I guess because I watched that movie, The Grapes of Wrath, I was fascinated with the depression and the dust bowl, and I, I don't know why, that, that sort of thing. And I used to ask my granny about the depression. And she said, well, we heard about it. And I said, what do you mean you heard of it? She said, well, we knew it was on and all, but really, we had nothing changed for us. She said, we were poor, we farmed, we had chickens. She said, nothing changed. She said, you know, I remember during the war not being able to get tires when you wanted them and whatnot. She said, but not a depression. We heard about it. Who was killing themselves during the depression? Rich people. Stop people. Stop people. Stop people. Those people that had put all their trust in that. Yes. My granny didn't have all that. Who was better off? People that didn't have all that. Yeah, see, nobody's knocking making a living or even if God blesses you and you, you get fruitful in it. What we're talking about is don't put your trust in folks. That stuff will be gone like that. Mm -hmm. So then in Timothy, he's speaking on these things. And he says in uh, 2 Timothy 2, verse 21, 
If a man therefore purge himself from these, he's talking about all these vessels of dishonor, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. Now, what's he talking about to, to cleanse yourself from? Go back up to verse 19. The foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are His. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Now, would you say that Christians today are naming the name of Christ with their mouth? Yes. They say lots of them, don't they? So then in the, in the particular case here, what he's saying, if you're going to name Christ as your Savior, what had you better do? Depart from iniquity. Now verse 20, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and earth, some to honor, some to dishonor. You mean there's both kind of vessels right there together in the house? And what's the difference between them? One's, one's being cleansed, one's cleansing, and the other's not. Okay? Uh, go over one more thing. Uh, if y'all would, go over to Titus 2. One book to the right. In Titus 2, verse 13, he says, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that, in other words, in order that, here's the purpose, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify in himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Now, would you say that Israel was zealous? Yes. Were they zealous of true righteousness and good works? No. They were zealous of an outward show. The Pharisees is the perfect example of that tree, aren't they? A big outward show of righteousness. And what did Christ say was on the inside? Filth and contamination. No fruit. Right? Uh, this also blows away the last group I used to study with. What's that? That verse right there. Oh, yeah. It sure does. It says works never matter. And Folks, does it make any sense to anybody that Jesus Christ would save someone and let them continue to grovel in sin? I mean, I can't believe yeah. I ever believed that. But when you first saved, all you know is my sins are forgiven. The weight's off and... It don't mean you're not saved. It just means somebody's giving you some bad advice. Mm -hmm. Alright, now, I want to just consider a couple things about this. <clears throat> Jesus Christ expected fruit, didn't He? We just read, He expects fruit, right? When He went to that tree, did He go there sincerely hoping He was about to get a meal and get there and go, oh, is that what happened? Mm -hmm. Not at all. Okay. When Jesus Christ came to Israel, did He really think all Israel was about to repent and get, make, accept the kingdom and make Him a king? Mm -hmm. Folks, when they wanted to make Him a king in John 6, He got away from them. Mm -hmm. Did He know exactly what was going to happen when He came? Yes. Yeah. Did anything happen that He was unaware of? Mm -hmm. Okay, not at all. Now, when a person makes a profession, all right, God in the Scripture, you can see, hates deception, does He not? Mm -hmm. Beware of false prophets. Beware of these. God never cut down Rome. God never poured out wrath on, on Greece and all that. I'm not saying they were God's people. I'm saying that, look, God has a certain amount of grace, natural grace, that the world just drinks of. Mm -hmm. But Israel, Jerusalem, they got it, didn't they? They got it because of the profession they made. They claimed to be some. In other words, they were in a position of deceit, weren't they? All right. You go back back to the day. How about I, I, when I was in business? One of the things I learned very quickly was look out when a guy hands you a business card and you see that fish on there. You know, oh, yeah. Oh, people yeah. would come all the time wanting to do work for you. You know, hey, I'm an electrician. I'm this or that. And he would hand you the card and you'd look at it and I'd see that fish and I'd just tell him, no, thank you. Run the other way. Now, I wasn't saved, but I knew one thing. I've been burned enough by that. Mm -hmm. What is he trying to do with that fish? Trying to get a job. Well, he's, trying to, he's trying to capitalize on the name of yeah, Christ. That's exactly right? right. Okay. Was Israel doing the same thing? Yeah. Therefore, did they pay a, a higher price? Mm -hmm. Okay. If that fig tree had leaves, it should have had fruit, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Let me, let's do it this way. Wasn't Christ right to expect fruit on the tree that had leaves? Yes. And isn't He right to expect works on someone, the works of Christ, on someone that claims to belong to Christ? All right, let's, let's make an example of it. You, you got somebody who has a kid. All right, I knew a fellow one time, 
him and his wife had a little boy. This guy was from, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, it's not Sicily. It's one of the islands right there. Of course. I can't remember. One of the, it, he was Italian. I mean, he was, he, he had hair from, his hair never stopped on the back of his neck. It went right on down his whole back. He was just, but they had a child. <laughs> okay. He and this, this girl had a child, and the girl also was, uh, she was a dark-complected girl. Real pretty girl, but she was dark-complected. They had this kid, and when they first come down to the boat with that kid, everybody on there was looking at that kid. Folks, that kid was pale, light hair, blue-eyed. Everybody's looking. Now, I know that can happen. There's genetic things that happen, but what was everybody thinking? Who's the father? Who's the daddy? Yeah. He, and you look at it, you know, as a child begins to grow, especially in the old... Look, we, we've lost this with all our medical and whatnot. Y'all know them old-timers that look and say they, they could see things in kids, couldn't they? Mm -hmm. But as that child begins to grow, don't you expect it to begin to look like its dad? If it doesn't, if it looks more and more like somebody else, what do you begin to do? Look at the milkman. Yep. You, begin to, you look for the milkman. <laughs> in other words, you begin to doubt the, the parentage of that person, don't you? Well, what did Jesus Christ basically say? One more verse here. We'll quit. Y'all go to John 8. This is really a, a good summation of the whole thing with the fig tree. In John 8, verse 30. We come here all the time because this really is one of the most important passages for us to understand exactly what's going on in the church today. In verse 30, As He, Jesus, spake these words, many believed on Him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on Him, If you continue in My word, then are you My disciples indeed. Now have they professed to believe on Him? Mm -hmm. There's your leaves, but where's the fruit? In the word. And He said, if you, continue, I'll, if you continue in My word, that's beginning fruit, right? Now watch. They answered Him, We be Abraham's seed. Hey, we're the fig tree. We're the fig tree. And we were never in bondage to any man. Now sayest thou, you shall be made free. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. They were in bondage to sin, and they didn't know it. He says, The servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that you're Abraham's seed, physically, but you seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. If his word has no place in them, and three chapters before he said, my word is spirit and it is life. Are these people regenerated? Are they his people? No. But are they professing to be? No. It says, I speak that which I have seen with my father. You do that which you have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. Mm. If that boy belonged to that man on my boat, that boy eventually start looking like him, generally speaking, wouldn't he? If someone is a child of God, what's going to begin to happen? You are being conformed to the image of His Son. Ain't that what He said He came to do? If you don't see something uh, beginning in the confirming of that thing, then what do you have a right to do? Suspect the parentage, don't you? Jesus just told them, if you were Abraham's seed, you would have the fruit of Abraham. You'd be doing the works of Abraham. But He goes on and tells them, 41, ye do the deeds of your father. They said unto him, We be not born of fornication. We have one Father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your Father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but He sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. He abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is the father of it. You know what he just did right there? He just cursed them like the fig tree. He said, you're claiming to be God's people bearing fruit. You claim you're Abraham's seed, where's Abraham's fruit? Now that's exactly what we're talking about when these people make a profession of Christ. Y'all know more harm is done to the true church by those that profess to be Christians because they're out there showing their leaves, aren't they? Mm -hmm. But you know they're not fooling anybody because they're looking for their fruit. Just as soon as you get out there and do something stupid as a Christian, a sincere Christian, you do something stupid, who's there? The world's right there watching, aren't they? Now what does that do? 
See there, that's why I don't fool with that. Bunch of hypocrites and whatnot. That's why Jesus cursed that fig tree because of the shame they were bringing on His name and His Father's name. Okay? Alright, do y'all have any questions about that? Alright, well thank y'all very much. Thank you.